Hey y'all, this is Ashley from Cannabis Nursing Solution. They be like, cannabis is medicine. How can we call this plant medicine, right? So, <clears throat> I go by Ashley. I am an endocannabinoid specialty nurse. You can go ahead and give me a follow on Instagram at Cannabis Nursing Solutions if you want to see anything that I post daily. But I want to talk to you all about cannabis as medicine, right? Like we talk about it, but we don't really give any like formed idea about what it is. Um, so I like to break down definitions if y'all haven't noticed. So let's define medicine first. Medicine is a compound or preparation used for the treatment or prevention of disease, especially a drug or drugs that can be taken by mouth, right? So examples of that include Vicodin, include Valium, Xanax, right? But have we ever taken some time to consider where they fall on the uh, drug classification list? So those drugs, let's take Vicodin, for example. Vicodin is a Schedule II drug. Uh, Xanax falls under Schedule IV. A Schedule II drug, it has a high potential for abuse and with its use can be potentially leading to severe or psychological disease or physical dependence. On the other hand, Schedule IV drugs have the low potential for abuse and low risk for dependence. Okay, all right, cool. So now we know that, but what about Schedule I drugs? And we know that cannabis sits on the Schedule I category. What else is on there with it? Heroin, LSD, ecstasy. But there is no currently accepted medical use if it falls under Schedule I. That's interesting, right? So as a nurse, I'm not going to hand out heroin to my patients for their pain. But I will give them fentanyl, oxycodone, um, dilaudid for their pain, right? And they fall under Schedule Two. Huh. That's very interesting. I mean, just think about the dynamics. So let me just break it down so it makes more sense, right? So Schedule One, we have no currently accepted medical use and high potential for abuse. And in that category falls heroin, LSD, ecstasy, and cannabis. Under Schedule Two, it has a high potential for abuse. And with its use, and with its use, potentially leading to severe psychological or physical dependence, right? And under that, under that category falls Vicodin, cocaine, methadone, dilaudid, oxycodone, fentanyl, Adderall, and rit Ritalin. And that's just to name a few. And then we have Schedule Three drugs like ket ketamine. I'm, I'm sorry, Schedule Two drugs like ketamine. And then Schedule Four like Xanax, Valium, Ativan, et cetera. And then we also have Schedule Five um, Lyrica falls under that, but I say all that, and I didn't break down the definitions again for the lower categories. I say all that to say all the drugs from schedule two and below are things that we will administer in the hospital. And we've all seen the effects of those drugs. Um, let's give Del audit. For example, we've seen the effects of a patient who is addicted to dilaudid asking you to come in when exactly when their PR and schedule says two to four hours, they call you exactly at one, one hour and 59 minutes, right? So we're allowed to hand those drugs out. They do have a place, right? They have, they serve its perfect purpose, but let's remember that all drugs have um, their pros and their cons. They all can have side effects, right? So when we're talking about medicine, it is defined as a compound, right? So what, are we talking about when it when we're talking about cannabis what compounds are we actually referring to the compounds that we're referring to are the cannabinoids for the most part and the terpenes there are phytocannabinoids and there are endocannabinoids phytocannabinoids are naturally produced in the plant the endocannabinoids are naturally produced in the body. The phytocannabinoids that you're probably used to hearing about is THC and CBD. But like I said, there's over a hundred. We need more research. We need to understand those cannabinoids a little bit better. Some we know a lot about, some we don't know as much about, right? And then there are terpenes. There are over 200 of them. 
they're the part that smell good. Um, and there are some common ones that we're familiar with, like limonene, pinene, linalool. Limonene, for example, exists in lemons, linalool, and lavender, etc. They're all found in natural resources, different foods that we eat on a day to day basis. Now that we've talked about these compounds, and we've talked about the definition of medicine. Now let's talk to, talk about how your body receives that medicine. And it's done through the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system is a large complex neuroreceptor system. We don't know everything there is to know about this system yet, but we do know a lot. It has receptors throughout the body and not just in the brain. Some people like to think it's just in the brain. And that's why this is your brain on drugs joke haha. um but it has cb1 receptors and cb2 receptors cb1 receptors are mostly located in the central nervous system and it plays a part in motor control memory and pain cb2 is mostly located in the peripheral nervous system and the immune system um and it affects pain inflammation uh gi response immune suppression etc so it has a lot of different uses throughout the body and these are all things to consider when we're um, as nurses talking about it for as medicine and even physicians and providers. But one thing a lot of people don't realize is that there are other receptors that receive the compounds or the cannabinoids that are in the plant. An example of that is the 5-HT receptor. It is actually located in the central and, ner and peripheral nervous system. And it's the same receptor that SSRI drugs can bind to, like Lexapro and Prozac, it actually binds to this 5-HT receptor. And that can have effects of feelings, uh, I'm sorry, anxiety, depression, addiction, et cetera, et cetera. And then within this endocannabinoid system, there are various enzymes um, that help break down the cannabinoids when there's too much in the bloodstream. Um, and there are also fatty acids that break down the endocannabinoids naturally. So we've talked about the compounds themselves, how they interact with the body. And now the third piece of this pie that a lot of us don't think about, but is part of our day-to-day -day practice is understanding the duration and onset, right? So in order to determine what will work best for a patient, you need to know how quickly it'll come on and how to predict when it'll have effects on the body so that way you can determine whether or not it's had the impact that it's intended to have right so different routes of administration and even people don't even realize how many different routes there are examples are inhalation ingestion transdermally topicals etc um a lot of people like to demonize inhalation but it actually has the quickest onset and it has a more direct effect. So if you're having acute symptoms, sometimes inhalation or smoking is probably the best option to relieve whatever symptoms are occurring. And then ingestion, there's a lot of people with horror stories about how they took too much and started seeing pink elephants in the room. Well, a lot of that has to do with overconsumption and not being mindful that the, the effects can be magnified by four to 10 times. Right. So eating about 15 milligrams of cannabis is actually equal to about 150 milligrams of inhaling. So you think that it's equivalent, but it's not. So and then in addition to that, the long the longer onset of effects makes people feel as though they're not getting as much of the medicine as they would um, as they originally thought or they're not experiencing the effects of the medicine. We all live in this um, uh right here right now society we want things to happen right now when you're ingesting it just does not work that way it can last as long as eight hours you can go to sleep and still feel the effects of when you ate something at 12 midnight right so if you ate something at 12 and then ate something again at one and then two you might still be feeling the effects well into the next morning and then it's layered upon layers because you took so many doses of it so again Understanding the onset and duration is overly important. So I started off letting you all know where cannabis steps, uh, lays in the scheduling system. I can't change that. 
that that is a uh, policy there are a lot of details that go into ch changing somebody i mean the drug from schedule one to schedule two or three or four or whatever but what we need to take note is that they're defining it as having no medical value so we don't administer it in in hospitals we don't it's not part of our practice which is probably why we're not taught it in in nursing school medical school etc but i just broke down to you the different part ways that it is based on the definition that's easily googleable um and cannabis is medicine right so takeaway here i have a couple of takeaways there are no differences in medical cannabis versus recreational cannabis besides the laws the only thing that really makes it different is who has access to the medicine and why they chose it. So, because it interacts with the body the exact same way. Medical grade cannabis and recreational cannabis does not interact differently in the body. The other thing is patients who choose to consume should be fully aware of what and why they choose to consume it since it is a patient driven medication. Unlike other medications where nurses have to closely monitor and uh, keep track of and write prescriptions for, et cetera. Um, patients get absolute choice as to how and when they choose to use it. So they need to be very much aware of these facts that I just shared with you today. The third conclusion, healthcare professionals have the right to be informed on the complexities of cannabis as medicine. And we need to participate in the decisions that affect our patients. We are the change agents. We are the advocates. That goes under our list of roles and responsibilities is not the medicine hand or outer. We have an active role in healthcare. So my name is Ashley. Thank you so much for taking a listen to me today. Um, please, 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 please feel free to share with your networks, leave comments, please engage with this content. I always say this cannabis uh, brands, cannabis businesses actually get suppressed on social media outlets. So it's important that people who listen to this content, if you find value in it, that you share it. So again, follow me on Instagram at Cannabis Nursing Solutions. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Talk to you soon. Bye.